so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, um, and welcome to this session. My name's Kim Dovey and I'm Director of INFER, the Informal Urbanism Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. And while we are all from many parts of this wonderful planet, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the particular place where this event is hosted, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, whose land was invaded in the early 19th century and has never been ceded. This particular session is entitled Rethinking Urban Informality and it involves 10 minute presentations from our three guests um, <clears throat> in Pakistan, in New York and in Melbourne. So very global session. It's almost like a, it's, a, it's 11 a.m. in Melbourne, which is coffee time. So this is a bit like a, a faculty seminar uh, coffee time. Just happen to have three brilliant guests from all around the world. We will then, uh, after they have presented, we'll have substantial time for discussion, which I'll manage as best I can through a regular Zoom process. So please keep your microphones muted at all times unless you are speaking. Our first speaker will be Pfizer Motorson, who is Assistant Professor of Architecture and Ur in Urbanism and Urban Design at the University of Southern California. She has a PhD from the University of Michigan and has published in Urban Studies and Antipode and is author of the forthcoming book, Elite and Ordinary Informalities. Uh, we want to thank her especially today because she's gotten up in the middle of the night. I think it's about 5 a.m. in um, Pakistan. And her talk today is entitled Elite Informality and Formal Informal Relations in the Making of Islamabad. Faiza. Okay, please let me know if you can't see my screen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Kim, Crystal, and Tanzil for all your efforts in organizing the symposium. It is really a privilege for me to be a part of this panel. Today, I will be presenting on elite informality, formal informal relations in the making of Islamabad. Towards the edge of the high modernist city of Islamabad, large mansions cluster around a, along a beautiful lake, sheltering some of Pakistan's most elite citizens. Built on protected parkland surrounding what is Islamabad's major water source, these exclusive villas are in breach of the city's official master plan. In today's paper, I will present the case of an elite yet in unauthorized neighborhood of Banigala in the National Park area in Islamabad to show the embeddedness of informality in formal planning uh, frameworks. The National Park area is one of the three main regions organizing Islamabad's high modernist master plan developed in 1960 by Greek architect and planner Konstantinos Doxiadis. Doxiadis planned the National Park area as a large open space accommodating low density public facilities, such as sports and exhibition complexes, education and research institutions, and other non-residential functions that do not generate heavy vehicular traffic. Beginning in the 1980s, certain elite individuals started buying properties and building lavish mansions in the undeveloped area of Banigala next to Rawal Lake in the National Park. They selected this region, undeveloped region, for its low land prices, uh, but also for its demarcation in the official master plan as a scenic bucolic setting complete with a lake, natural streams, and forested hills, all within close proximity to the urban areas of Islamabad. Using the example of the elite informal neighborhood of Banigala, I will argue today that the official master plan of Islamabad is more than a planning guide for its future urban development. It is a living document that is consulted by the residents and city officials to identify sites for informal constructions and is modified to accommodate new functions introduced through informal planning mechanisms. The interplay between formal and informal procedures um, and practices is also evident in the way that residents of Banigala legitimized this neighborhood and how its legitimization initiated a process of revision of Islamabad's official master plan and zoning regulations. Long before Banigala became an affluent neighborhood, it was one of the small villages that had existed in the vast site selected for the new city of Islamabad. So the way uh, planning and development process works in Islamabad is that uh, the municipal authority of Islamabad first um, has to purchase private land holdings 
uh, belonging to people who had been living in existing villages like Banigala for generations. In 1960s, CDA acquired nearly most of the private land in the national park next to the Ravel Lake. Banigala, however, remained unacquired. The, uh, in addition to the complicated configuration of land ownership, administrative control over Islamabad, um, capital, Islamabad's capital territory is shared between two government organizations. The metropolitan area of Islamabad is subdivided into urban and rural areas, areas developed according to a grid of identical neighborhood communities, according to the Doxiadis master plan, are considered urban and are governed by uh, the Capital Development Authority or CDA. The administration of rural areas come, uh, comes under the Islamabad capital territory called, or also called ICTA. Most of the areas designated under the national park area, including Balingala, are rural and come under ICTA's authority. However, only CDA holds the power to plan and develop Islamabad according to the official master, plans, a master plan. And this means that all new constructions in both urban and rural areas of Islamabad need formal approval from CDA. Elite home builders of Banigala recognized the lacuna in land ownership and administrative structure in Islamabad to build an exclusive neighborhood on their own in violation of the master plan. Because Banigala village had not been acquired by CDA, those interested in building their houses in the scenic bucolic uh, setting started to buy land directly from the local villages, thus bypassing CDA's authority as the sole developer of Islamabad. New elite home builders of Banigala purchased their land legally from local villager, villagers, yet they used it for illegal land use to build lavish mansions on expansive lots with stunning views. Here's an example of a private residential gated compound built on about 8.75 acres of land located along the banks of Ravel Lake. This compound comprises five mansions belonging to four siblings and a friend with a room for another house in the future. The community is walled and can be accessed via two entry gates. A private security guard monitors the entry of visitors into the compound. The elite home builders of Banigala were successfully able to build this neighborhood in a protect, uh, their neighborhood in a protected zone of Islamabad using various strategies, such as mobilizing their monetary resources and networks of political connections with other elites, developing new opportunistic alliances with the non-elites, using bureaucratic devices and carrying out um, a media, successful media campaign to legitimize their illegal building activities. Out of these processes, I will only focus on the strategy of creating a pseudo-legal paper trail in the legitimization process of Bani Gala. This process was based on actions of elite builders to complicate the illegal status of their residential community by actively creating and maintaining impression of legal conformity of an otherwise non-conforming space. For example, several elite home builders in Banigala created a documentary paper trail of official correspondence with various ICTA and CDA representatives to legitimize their illegal building activity. Since ICTA controls the rural areas of Islamabad, the elite home builders sought approval for the construction of their new houses from ICTA. The approval process involved the submission of architectural drawings of the proposed house to the chairman of an ICTA village council, who issued his permission in the form of a signature and an official stamp on the submitted architectural drawings. This permission process was a pure concoction since the village council did not have any uh, jurisdiction or such approval process for authorizing new buildings in rural areas under its control. New residents of Banigala received official approval for their houses, not because they wanted to follow existing building and zoning laws in Islamabad. Instead, they concocted official documents as counter evidence to prove the legitimacy of their actions should they be challenged at a later stage. The development of Bani Gala as an up and coming neighborhood in rural Islamabad was not totally lost on the municipal authority, it's called CDA. After years of inaction and feeble heart hearted attempts, to thwart residential construction of constructions of powerful elites in this area, CDA finally took a militaristic approach towards solving this zoning irregularity. In June 1992, the then chairman of CDA announced CDA's acquisition of land in Banigala area. Without following proper procedure, the chairman hastily launched a, a military-style anti-encroachment operation to free the land from all 
illegal residential encroachment uh, constructions. After carrying out the anti-encroachment drive for two days, CDA, with the help of a large contingent of police personnel, was successful in demolishing several houses in Bani Gala. However, those of the most influential were spared. After the um, operation was halted on the orders of the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, who intervened on the request of one of Bani Gala's elite home builders, residents of this neighborhood went to court to file a case against CDA and its forceful acquisition of their neighborhood. After fighting a legal battle with CDA for six years, residents of Banigala received favorable verdicts in 1998 and 1999 in the High and Supreme Courts of Pakistan, respectively. The final judgment made reference to one such paper correspondence, um, between, to, to one uh, paper correspondence between a home builder and a CDA official to infer that CDA was well aware that the construction of these houses in Banigala had been going on for years. By balancing illegal spatial practices and legal procedures, the residents of Banigala were thus able to create conflicts between CDA and the courts and prove the legitimacy of their actions via legal decisions. The court decisions on the elite informal neighborhood of Banigala have had long-term consequences for Islamabad's formal planning framework. According to Islamabad Capital Territory's zoning regulation of 1992, which was based on Doxiadis' original master plan, residential and commercial constructions were completely prohibited in the National Park area, which is zone four. Following court decisions on elite informal constructions in the National Park area in 2005, revisions were made in the official zoning regulations to open up the National Park for limited residential constructions. Zoning amendments in 2010 further legalized commercial in addition to more residential construction in the once protected national park area. These zoning changes have now opened up the national park for the construction of many large scale elite residential gated communities by both private developers and CDA itself, which are all in violation of the official, uh, of Doxiadis' original master plan. These changes in official regulations suggest that informal spaces like Banigala that were initially developed in breach of the official master plan may eventually institute major structural changes in the planning regulations and planning frameworks. The elite citizens of Banigala made informal claims to space while paying close attention to the formal planning uh, framework. By challenging the authority of CDA and subverting the planning framework established by Doxiadis, Elite home builders of Banigala participated in a mode of, of urbanism firmly rooted in formal and informal relations and practices. Thank you. Uh, Kim, could you unmute yourself? My apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Faisal, and uh, I'm sure that that will uh, whet our appetite for the book. Um, I'm going to go straight on to the second speaker, and we'll have the discussion at the end. Our second speaker is Ryan Devlin, who is a is visiting professor in urban planning at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. He holds a PhD from UC Berkeley and has published on urban informality in the journals Planning Theory, Planning Theory and Practice, and International Jour Journal of Urban and Regional um, <clears throat> Planning. His talk today is entitled On the Support of Tolerance of Loose Ends and Back Doors. Ryan. Well, thank you very much. And we go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, first, thank uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm honored to be part of this symposium. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this, well, this evening for me, and morning and early morning for some others, um, or afternoon somewhere else perhaps as well. Uh, in line with some of the other uh, papers in this symposium, some of what uh, Kurt Ibsen spoke about last week and um, some of the other papers in this panel, uh, uh, including Faiza, I wanna talk about, uh, train my focus here on the informality of the state. Uh, and imper important work has been done uh, by people in this symposium, as the, as the pre uh, presentation that we just saw, 
Uh, important work has been done demonstrating the ways in which the state's own informal practices can support uh, an elite informality of developers uh, and other elite interests. Uh, and what I want to do uh, in this, in my time here, is to talk about uh, another sort of angle on the informality of the state. I want to propose that informal spaces open by the state can also be sites of radically progressive planning and policy practice. Uh, in order to make it such, we need to acknowledge the importance of the space between laws as written and laws as experienced and enforced. Uh, which I think, again, Fayez just showed us uh, how much goes on in those spaces. Uh, we need to think about what it means to use this space intentionally and self-consciously as, as progressive planners. Uh, and I've sort of, uh, this is a very much a work in progress, um, uh, termed the, this uh, uh, potential approach to something called supportive tolerance, uh, which is a deeply open-ended approach to planning, not simply geared towards compliance, upgrading, or formalization, but to building and maintaining an ongoing dialogue about the use and form of urban space. Uh, it's just a quick outline uh, of the talk. I, what I want to say, though, is that my, this is a very kind of, this is a sketch. Um, I'm using, I'm trying to kind of uh, stay within the spirit of a symposium and, and using this as a venue to kind of test out some ideas. So, um, so any feedback or criticism or, or um, additions uh, are more than welcome. I look forward to the discussion coming up. So the seeds of this presentation and this idea were laid almost 10 years ago uh, as I was studying a conflict over informal vending in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, by the time the controversy arose in the late 2000s, uh, vendors, all of them immigrants from Latin America, had been in this park, which you see uh, here, uh, it's a large park in the Red Hook neighborhood of Brooklyn. They had been here for 30 years uh, by the late, like 2010, um, selling food during soccer matches uh, that were taking place in the park. So right around 2007, 2008, these vendors gained a lot of uh, sort of mainstream popularity uh, and also uh, the attention of the health department and the parks department, who knew they were there for 30 years, but had sort of more or less ignored them. Uh, by 2007, 2008, uh, the city cracked down uh, on the practice, um, attempted a, 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 a process of formalization, which ultimately didn't work. And, and nowadays these vendors, some of them are still there, but it doesn't exist in the same form as it existed about 10 years ago. So as part of the research into this uh, conflict, I did a lot of interviews with, pe with people within the city, within the Parks Department uh, and Department of Health. And I remember one interview really stuck with me. And it was a, a talk I was having with a woman who worked for the Parks Department. And during the course of the interview, she was sort of towing the company line saying, you know, oh, they didn't have permits, they didn't do this, you know. And as we got to talking more, she just, she kind of broke character in a sense, right? And, and sort of gave a deep sigh and said, look, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't want to crack down on them, the vendors. We liked that they were there. They activated the park. They cleaned up after themselves. They were good for the park, but they didn't have permits. We wish we could have kept them there, but there was no way. We can't have one set of rules for one group and another set of rules for another. Our hands were tied. And in my research on informality, I've done a lot of, I've had a lot of conversations with people working within uh, the city who express similar, you know, when, when you talk to folks in the city, you often expect them to be the, the sort of typical, well, you know, these people shouldn't be here, they need to follow the rules, it's black and white. Uh, and more and more I, I was hearing uh, these sorts of feelings of feeling trapped, right, for not having tools to deal uh, with these uh, processes in ways that even people working in the city felt were not necessarily all bad, that, had, that they wish they could have figured out a way to uh, be more creative. Uh, and so this conversation has stuck with me. And you know, one of the things that when we talk about uh, how the state uh, and state regulators deal with informality, uh, I think you often, you often think of three, at least for me, I think of three approaches, right? One, on, on the one hand, you have crackdowns. Uh, on the other hand, you have a, what was happening in Brooklyn for 30 years, uh, which is more or less ignoring the issue, under, knowing that it exists, but not doing anything about it. Uh, and then a process of, of formalization, uh, which all of these, of course, have their, their drawbacks. And what I wanted to explore, and what I'm trying to explore, and this is, this is in, as I said, the beginning stages of potentially a potential paper, is the space here between sort of formalizing and ignoring. 
right? So what if we, we really as planners, as thinkers, and also as practitioners start thinking about how we can use this conceptual space and taking some of the strong points of both. The, so it, when, when informality is ignored by the state, it's allowed to, to flourish, to evolve in, 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 its, in its own ways, um, to be sort of nimbly respond to, to, uh, to, to certain um, needs. Uh, and I think one of the positive things about formalization is that at the very least, it, it's, it's an acknowledgement of the state that this, this belongs here in some form, though, of course, oftentimes uh, the formalization process as it, under, as it uh, occurs is usually just to kind of get rid of a problem rather than really support uh, informal activity. So uh, just very quickly, I don't want to do a, a full literature review, but obviously these, these ideas don't come from nowhere. Um, they're deeply informed by, for instance, Ananya Roy's Foundational Insights, Teddy Cruz's really creative and interesting work uh, along the U.S.-Mexico uh, border in San Diego and Tijuana, uh, Abdul Malik Simone's uh, approach to the urbanism of anticipation, and Kim uh, Dovey's uh, asking us to, to think about how we can respond policy with policy to these complex adaptive systems. Uh, and sort of the, some of the philosophical underpinnings come from Jacques Rancière, whose insights on the sort of fundamental and radical importance of actions undertaken by the poor um, and, and accepting these as, as sort of interventions in themselves. And that informs one of the underpinnings of my approach, which is this notion of informality as communication by doing. Uh, uh, planners and policymakers would be uh, well served by seeing informal actions as the urban poor telling us through practice what they need the city to be and to become. Not without problems, these actions of course are not without their problems. Uh, sometimes there's serious health and safety concerns that come along with them, but it's nevertheless a valid form of speech intervening into the urban environment. Right. Uh, and if these actions are viewed as valid, uh, then how do we, again, I'm sort of positioning us and, and conceptually here as, as, as planners who might be working with activists, who might be working within city government. I'm thinking about what I could tell my students as to, you know, what are some approaches to dealing with these, uh, these issues, uh, my, my master students who go out into to the world of practice. Uh, and if we view these actions as inherently valid, uh, how do the, the question, and I think one of the big questions for, for planners who see value in informal solutions uh, derived, uh, devised by the urban poor to urban problems, how do we go about supporting these without destroying them, which is often what happens when, when you see a process of formalization. So as I said, these are rough ideas, uh, uh, but I've, I've been thinking about this notion of what it, what it would mean to, to have an approach of supportive tolerance. Uh, and by this, I mean as a, a shift away from a kind of obsession with compliance and formalization towards a more open-ended, uh, temporary provisional policy approach. Um, and it also asks planners to, to, to really focus in, which I think a lot of people are doing now academically, uh, but I think sometimes in terms of practice and what we, what we teach our, our students, to really focus in on the, the, that space between laws as written and laws as enforced. On enforcement, not just enforcement and policy, but on the norms that take place um, in that space uh, and the sort of wiggle room that gets created. Again, as Faiza showed us, oftentimes to the, to the, uh, to the benefit of those who can, can work the system. Uh, but I guess I'm asking what happens when we, when we turn the system on its head and use that space to benefit uh, the urban poor. Uh, so thinking about different approaches, uh, you know, in my title, I have this notion of loose ends and, and back doors. The, the idea of loose ends is just this notion of keeping things open um, through things like pilot programs, temporary use permits, variances, all of these tools that exist in, in planning, uh, but are often used to support uh, uh, more elite interests, right? Uh, which all of them become sort of exceptions or spaces of experimentation outside formal law. And the, the idea of back doors is a little bit more um, tricky, uh, but, it, but it speaks towards the, really the informal space of things like enforcement, uh, things like using, using unofficial tools to help support uh, informal action. Uh, what I've called it sort of term loosening the punitive screws, right? So things like fine reduction, decriminalization, um, uh, thinking about enforcement norms and priorities. And what's great 
is that, you know, I mean, this is in many ways in the process of theory building from, from the ground up, because we see examples of this happening. Uh, and, and I want, I guess I want to bring some of what's already happening in practice, often driven by activist groups on the ground. Uh, I'm thinking of what's in the United States, but of course all over the world, uh, who use that space uh, and use this notion of, of legitimacy to, to demand uh, that the state treat them in sometimes officially and sometimes unofficially in a better way, right? So quickly, uh, as I, I'll end this presentation on uh, very quickly running through some examples. One comes from my field work here in New York of Mexican street vendors uh, in the Bronx along uh, Fordham Road, which is a major commercial uh, street in, in a largely lower income black and Latino neighborhood uh, in, in the Bronx. Uh, and for a long time, these Mexican street vendors, most of whom are, were immigrants, many of whom were undocumented, many of whom, most of whom were women, uh, would be harassed by police officers uh, and they were subject to very harsh treatment. They were oftentimes arrested. Uh, they had their merchandise confiscated. Many of them had their children with them. Uh, when their children got off from school, they would stay with their mothers on the sidewalk. Uh, and sometimes they were separated from their children if they had to spend a night in jail. And so what activist groups did was negotiate with the local precinct uh, to come up with new enforcement norms. Again, based on this legitimizing of these are women with children trying to make a living, they shouldn't be treated as criminals. Uh, and the cops uh, eventually agreed to use another tool that they had in their tool book, which was a $25 ticket versus arresting and taking to jail. So not officially legitimizing, these, they were still unlicensed vendors, but certainly changing the experience of enforcement on the street in a dramatic way. Uh, a quick other example, things happening in US cities, the decriminalization of vending in Los Angeles is another example of not necessarily legalizing vending, at least that first step of decriminalizing that didn't necessarily legalize all vending, but it took, uh, uh, it protected vendors from the most harsh, the harshest form of enforcement. And this has happened in New York just in the last month or two. Uh, with the NYPD is no longer uh, tasked with vending enforcement as part of all of the protests that have happened and pushback against uh, ne uh, negative uh, aspects of policing. Uh, and finally, a quick example of, of pilot programs, uh, again, from, from New York, from Brooklyn, uh, where South Asian uh, immigrant uh, activists have, uh, a, a lot of them are homeowners, a lot of them also live in basement apartments in the outer boroughs, um, and they have uh, fought to, to take the lead on a program of regularization of basement apartments um, in using pilot programs in eastern parts of Brooklyn. So just to, to end, I know there's a lot of things very quickly and, and again, it's very loosely formed, maybe keeping with the ethic of, <laughs> of, of uh, supportive tolerance, uh, keeping things loose and open. Um, all of this points to planning and the planning and policy approach that's comfortable with open-endedness, that works through values of radical empathy, uh, that asks planners to follow the lead of activists and residents and users of space on the ground to serve a supportive role rather than be the principal shapers of the urban environment. A significant departure, of course, from classic models, but one that I feel is uh, uh, very much needed. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> and I will stop. So thank you, Ryan. And we'll go straight to the, our third speaker, who is Ari Jerems, who teaches international relations at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. And his work has been published in Citizenship Studies and Borderlands. There is a co-author of this work, who's I noticed also in the audience, uh, Patricio Landetta, who is also with us on Zoom and is a philosopher with the Center for Advanced Studies at UPLA University in Valparaiso in Chile. Uh, Patricio may want to come into the question sessions. Their talk is entitled uh, Transient Common Infrastructure, the Political Spaces of Assembly. Ari. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim. And, and thank you, Kim Tanzel and uh, Crystal for organizing a really great um, session and really interesting for me to present with um, urban studies scholars as well, and me and Patricio from um, different disciplines. So I'll just share my screen now. This is the right, the correct screen is being shared, I'm hoped. Okay, so, so our, um, our paper's titled Transient Common Infrastructure, the Political Spaces of Assembly as it ends on the urban uprisings in Chile. So, so in October, 2019, students in Santiago, Chile protested a rise in already expensive metro fares with organized fare evasion. 
The deployment of riot police against protesters sparked outrage, broadening the scope of the rebellion, which spread across the country and formulated demands contesting entrenched inequalities. The uprising, in conjunction with simultaneous protests that were occurring around the world, reinvigorated discussion about the political and social significance of urban uprisings. Dominant interpretations of the Chilean uprising in particular defined it through the slogan estallido social, or social explosion, alluding to its perceived spontaneous, informal, transient and unexpected nature. The perceived transient of uprisings has featured prominently in accounts of similar events globally, and I've got some examples of that up on the screen. Um, within this framework, events are understood as explosions followed by echoes that dissipate into silence. Sympathetic interpretations suggest that such transient intervention, interventions politicize dominant arrangements or serve as laboratories of, the politi of politics to come, whilst often lamenting their inability to create durable alternatives. So in this paper, what we try to do is challenge this notion of estallido social or social explosion by beginning to sketch the multiple temporal trajectories and spatial forms of the event. It is important to note that even when understood as an explosion, uprisings have numerous afterlives. So in the wake of the initial protest, the Chilean government developed security and governance innovations to capture and subdue protests, largely framing the explosion as a problem to be pacified. So innovations in terms of security legislation, riot control techniques and equipment have been continu continuously developed to prepare for what we could term, borrowing from Hiba Buaka, the wars yet to come. So beyond security measures, and particularly after what was described as the largest protest in Chile's history on the 25th of October 2019, the government claimed to have heard and understood the demands, offering concessions and announcing a new social deal. The concessions largely worked within a register of politics emerging through the relationship between governments and populations, defined by Partha Chatterjee as the politics of the governed. Following this logic, increased access to and control over government was not necessary. Rather, new modes of governmentality have sought to appease discontent. So we could say that framing the event as an, a social explosion leads on the one hand to its constitution as a problem of security and governance, and on the other to laments about its lack of durability. So we seek to move beyond assumptions of explosion by forwarding an alternative composition of the event. To do this, we argue that it is necessary to resist the urge to fasten a sing singular political significance to the uprising, but instead explore the material and effective spaces constituted. So Abdul Malik Simone's theorization of people as infrastructure provides a useful start starting point to grasp the emergent and material and effective spaces. Simone conceptualizes people as infrastructure in order to explore how residents in cities in the global south engage com uh, complex combinations of objects, spaces, and practices that become an infrastructure. So in his recent book, Improvised Lives, Simone links a similar understanding to bodies of collective enactment, suggesting that while a vanguard, a proletariat, or a political movement may not be simply anachronisms, it is necessary to consider the shape-shifting bodies of collective enactment, all of the ways in which people and things can and might operate in concert. Here, a more expansive notion of solidity might be required. Solid, not like flesh, but like a beat or an amalgam of a body and machine that issues beats, pulsations capable of carrying things away. So such an understanding of infrastructure permits an analysis of the unfolding rhythms of the event. In the days following fair evasion protests and police repression in Santiago, infrastructures and spaces of engagement emerged across the country. These revived historical refrains such as cacerolazos involving the banging of pots and pans and cabildos abiertos or open assemblies in parks, squares, streets and schools. Rather than stable spaces, the spaces of engagement emerged and shifted in ebbs and flows over time in unfolding rhythms. A collective of critical geographers has mapped out the events of the first days of the protest, which really helps to illustrate these unfolding battles across the city. So we can see here on the 18th and 19th, there's a whole range of things going on, and this is in Santiago, specifically with barricades, casarolazos, but also looting and some police repression. With the declaration of a, a curfew and a state of emergency in the next few days, the protests drop off slightly and, and, and then there's this extreme police um, repression on the 21st and 22nd of October before protesters again take over the streets leading to the, the mass protests on the 25th of October. 
So I'm just going to do, hopefully this works. Okay, so the choreography of ongoing interactions took place in what Merrill and colleagues have conceived as a more or less digital space. This space was constituted by coverage via social media, independent media reports, as well as webcams capturing developments 24 hours a day, such as the one um, we're seeing at the moment. The more or less digital space created an echo for the sonic and visual infrastructures of the movement, amplifying the atmospheres and moods beyond immediate spaces of engagement. As protests unfolded, there was an explosion of street art and musical performances and productions, um, such as the performance by feminist group Las Desis that reverberated on a global scale. The ongoing police brutality was reflected in artistic production, particularly with the prevalence of bloodied eyes with reference to those blinded by rubber bullets. Exploring these unfolding rhythms of the uprising helps avoid reducing the protest to a series of demands articulated in a fixed um, moment in time. Protesters were not simply interrupting or politicizing dominant arrangements, nor were they staging or acting out democratic forms, as some commentators like Swengedow have suggested, but rather the protests created spaces of engagement that emerged in conflict with dominant arrangements as they unfolded, unfolded over time. These spaces and rhythms of the event have continually been captured, interpreted, and resignified. Beyond these attempts to close down spaces, but beyond the attempts to close down spaces of, uh, and infrastructures of engagement, laments about their lack of durability uh, and their lack, their lack of durability. So, sorry, some schol scholars have sought to build on them to imagine new modalities of politics. So, Chilean political theorist Camila Vergara has argued for a new, a new form of citizenship through which the demands of people are incorporated into political decisions, decision making by networks of assemblies inspired by those created during the uprising. Whilst attractive, this framework similarly risks reducing the energy of the event to an institutional solution. Beyond institutional structures, the continual recuperation of the energy and lived experience of the event, the event is needed for the kinds of politics that Bredegada envisages. For this, we argue that a living archive of the event is needed, one that allows us to raise questions, investigate and exhume relics in order to continually remake the event as lived history. So the collective Valpo Recolecta contributes to this project by reassembling the layers of the revolt in Valparaíso. They seek on the one hand to reveal the new forms of social life constituted during the revolt, and on the other draw attention to the war waged by the state against these new forms. So to do this, the group firstly collects images of the protest, including those on the slides in this presentation that display the heterogeneity of protesters and exposes the affects that circulate in the transit and reunion of the multitude. Secondly, they register the statements and declarations made visible during the protest in banners, canvases, and on painted bodies. After each protest, they archive the posters, graffiti, engravings and stencils that were inscribed on the walls of the city. Thirdly, they compile images of the escalation of force used, by, used on protesters by the state. And fourthly, they compile and classify relic, the relics of the revolt that connect, it with, uh, connect us with its non-human materialities. So these include objects left by protesters, such as saucepan lids, spoons, shields, handkerchiefs, and banners, as well as those of the state, such as cartridges, tear gas, rubber bullets, and other materials used to repress. So these relics exceed the event understood as a problem of security and government and its solidification in well-known institutional responses, instead bringing its rhythms and infrastructures back to life. Through these transient infrastructures and refrains of political action are inscribed in memory to be recreated in different circumstances in the future. In his study of the Paris Commune, Henri Lefebvre argued that the event had a double meaning and a double scope, summary and a symbol of a period now closed, announcement of a period that opens. It constituted an act of creativity that swept away certain assumptions, shifting the terrain of possibilities. In Lefebvre's account, the commune brought into being the possibility of organizing everyday life otherwise. The forms created and diverse interpretations of these had an ongoing impact on a worldwide scale. So in this sense, even when the protests come to an end, their significance has only just begun. And that's it for the presentation, but I'd just like to thank also um, Augusto Medina, Leandro Vivanco, Javier Carmona, and Patricio himself for, for the images that are used um, during the um, presentation. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Ari, and thank you very much to all of our speakers. As, uh, I think there's a lot to, um, to, to chew over there. To, uh, we've now got some time for maybe 20 minutes of discussion and to make life a little bit easier for me. If you have a question, can I ask you just to log your first name on the chat box and I will then uh, call you in turn. Please keep your mic muted at all times when not speaking. Um, so I want to begin this discussion by asking the three speakers first if they have any uh, questions or comments that have been prompted by the presentations uh, of the others. So uh, any of the three, Ari, Ryan, Faisal. Ryan. Uh yeah, hi. Well, I'll just uh, first both uh, of I, both of my co-presenters. Uh, I found your presentations very interesting and enlightening, and um, uh, especially as I was I was born in Chile. Uh, uh, my mother is Chilean, uh, and I, in fact, was supposed to go there right before uh, COVID shut things down. So I'm I'm uh, was disappointed, wasn't able to go back anyway. But so that was great to see as well. Um, I. You know, I, for just to go back to uh, Faiza's presentation, one th one thing that really I found interesting and that you identified uh, as as an important one of the important processes of the of how informalization of the state and where any lead informality works is this idea of legitimate legitimization, right? How uh, informal actors and I guess also state actors who are supporting that informality legitimize their um, their their actions and the reason it struck me is because i think that that also plays into a little bit what i'm talking about but in a different way right and if you think about vendors in los angeles uh the the legitimacy put forth for the argument of why they shouldn't be treated as criminals is is a, i mean maybe i'm you can tell me if, if i'm on the wrong track here but it seems to me to be a, a similar process of trying to inscribe legitimacy in actions that are technically illegal or informal um, in a similar way. Uh, and so that just struck me as an interesting connection. Um, yeah, it's more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but. Lisa? I guess I had, yeah, I had a similar comment. That's why I wasn't sure like if I should go first. Um, I saw Ryan, a lot of uh, parallels between our works. Um, especially how you talk about um, this dilemma that officials face um, on a, a daily basis um, a, a concerning you know, whether or not to enforce the plan as it's, as it's written on paper, um, and, or, uh, and especially when dealing with uh, low-income populations, um, well, I guess even for elite populations because there are various kinds of pressures. So in Islamabad as well, um, a part of my work is on um, street vending in the city. and. Um, there, you know, I've had similar conversation that you uh, narrated. So I guess the um, the question sort of that I is formulating in my mind is, um, you know, you talk about supportive tolerance, and I think it's really powerful. And I think in some, many ways, in in several contexts, it's also happening um, informally. Um, but I imagine that you were trying to make a case for making it more um, like a part of the formal system. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so if that is true, then I guess the question would be, um, you know, we can obviously gain um, empathy from or sympathy or like support from planning professionals or, you know, you know other progressives. Um, but when it comes to the middle class uh, citizens in many places, and also the upper class, there's a serious resistance against um, making such certain allowances, especially for uh, informal, um, you know, ordinary informal activities. Um, and so I think that's where it becomes like harder as a policy, as a strategy to be implemented at a formal level. So, so I mean, I, I don't know if there was a question there, but <laughs> that was where I was at. Ryan, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just be really brief, but I think you're, you're, those, pro those challenges are, are spot on and particularly the idea that you know, one of the, the things that, for instance, uh, helping people who live in illegal apartments in, in Brooklyn, they run up is exactly middle class residents who don't want 
apartment dwellers in their single family neighborhoods, right? And so, the, yes, formalizing this policy would be very politically difficult. And so I guess that's also where I, I find utility in that kind of backdoor area of how can we train planners, training is obviously partially formalizing as well, but, but how can we install, maybe it's more of an ethic, right, of, of seeing these, these actions as legitimate uh, and then trying to work creatively to support them sometimes officially, sometimes unofficially. Um, and that's sort of right now what I have in mind, uh, though it's a difficult thing to certainly institutionalize. Um, yeah. Okay, we go to Crystal Legacy with a question. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks, Kim. Uh, and thanks everyone for your presentations, fabulous. Um, my, my question is basically an extension to the last one around what is the role of the planner within the, between the interstitial spaces of the informal and the informal state. If radical empathy is one way in which the planner could um, conduct their practice, um, how, how can we push that further to consider a more proactive, uh, less reactive, um, um, transformative form of, of, of planner uh, in these spaces. So I'm just thinking around questions, terms like solidarity, advocacy, in, in what room do those words uh, play and serve in the interstitial spaces between the informal and formal state? Uh, is, is, I, 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 should well, I it's answer? a question for the panel generally, but yeah. Ryan, it's, I, was, I was triggered and inspired by, by your presentation with respect to the question, but I think um, all, panel, all panelists might have something to say about that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start briefly. I think the more I think about it, I think it, it's, it's about install, instilling values, particularly in planning education. Um, and, and thinking about using techniques from outside our field, right? I think the field of planning is changing. I think the kind of people that we come that come into master's programs in planning is starting to change. At least yeah, the, I've noticed it in the United States, who are really interested in 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 a social justice that operates in a more in a more radical way. In in my in in my experience, uh, and so part of it. I think is empowering some of the values uh, that, that already exist in, among our students and pushing them. Yeah, I mean, part of this notion of radical empathy comes from outside of planning, even thinking about informality in, in the terms of, of harm reduction, which comes from you know, uh, uh, psychology and, and addiction counseling, things like this, where you know, you're not trying to solve the full problem anymore, but you're, and informality is not the solution. I guess that's also one thing that I've been frustrated with sometimes the way informality is talked about, it, at least in the U.S., is that it's the new thing, it's the solution, it's you know, you know, this is this is the new way to do things informally, and it's not. It's a symptom of, of inequality in my mind, first and foremost, when we think about informality of the poor. So, if we think about it in a way as a symptom that needs to be dealt with, but also it's a solution as well. Um, you know, how can we start to enable planners to to think outside of the sort of more technocratic framework of we need to formalize, we need to, you know, follow specific uh, specific uh, techniques uh, in specific places. Uh, so I, I do think it, it comes from installing, instilling a particular ethic, uh, even through, through education um, and, and the kind of planners that, that we create. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll just point just quickly to, uh, when I think about something like transportation planning, where transportation planning now uh, it, it, most professional transportation planners are all about bicycles and pedestrianizing things. And that's happened slowly. You know, that certainly wasn't the case uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but through a, a culture change in that field, you, you have a, you're starting to see actual real world effects in the way cities are planned for, for different modes of transportation. So I'm, I'm hoping that that can happen in other sectors as well. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, Ridden Reccia. Hi, uh, thanks everyone for interesting presentations. My question is also addressed to Ryan. So in my own research of, about the politics of street vending in the Philippines, I've seen how in a way some level of supportive tolerance has been operating in different parts of the Philippines, in different cities. And the vendors are 
generally happy with how local governments are recognizing the legitimacy and uh, contribution of their activity. But in some areas, that uh, supportive tolerance is actually anchored on entrenched uh, clientelist network, you know, patron-client relationship. So, and, and that kind of relationship also marginalizes some vendors who are not part of that, you know, thick relationship between street level bureaucrats and uh, vendors. So how do you think supportive tolerance might be able to address this, uh, in a way, very tricky challenge? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know yet because I think it's a, it's a messy space, right? This, this space that I, that I think is important to explore is also, as I said, very messy. It can be very ugly. There can be very exploitative relationships, as you said, between client patrons, um, uh, between, uh, you know, the, to rely on, on the goodwill of, of enforcement agents, it, I don't think is a plan in and of itself. So I think that I, I'm, that's something that I'm still working through uh, because I also don't want to see this as some, again, a, a one solution, right? This is it, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna work in this space and we're gonna create a set of um, proposals and it's all gonna work out. It, it's a messy space. And I think driven, it, it, yeah, I, I don't know yet. And I think that's something that I still need to work on. And I, I think that it's a, a really good question um, and something I, I struggle with as well. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Manas Murthy, who, who has uh, typed a question here, but I'm going to ask him to say it to the screen. Are you there, Manas? Sorry, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's a fairly long question. So I, I it's probably good that I'm here to maybe explain some of it. I'm, I'm thinking sort of broadly, this is sort of goes beyond, uh, it's, it's not just sort of about the cases, uh, but about sort of recurring, uh, recurring framing of informality as uh, either as problem or as, you know, uh, the champion of whatever. Uh, so there's always this sort of uh, norm normality that is assigned to informality as if, uh, as if it can do stuff. Uh, but sort of beyond that, just sort of thinking from an assemblage theory sort of point of view, uh, I mean, both the idea of tolerance as you, as you're talking about, or as the, the Doxiadus plan that becomes a kind of frame of reference of what is being deviated from quote unquote, uh, they both sort of occupy this kind of transcendental position, uh, from where, uh, you know, uh, informal practices will, will be accorded some kind of uh, uh, you know, benefit or will be accorded some kind of tolerance in this case. Um, so I'm sort of in question, uh, and, and, and this is not just sort of people. So it's sort of, uh, it's not just about government or government infrastructures being in this transcendental position, but also that laws themselves or documents can hold that position. And that's the same case, uh, for example, in the case of Delhi with the master plan, again, occupying that position of as if the master plan is sort of, you know, the things are deviating from the master plan is as a frame of reference. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you sort of follow this, uh, the, the kind of assemblage point of view uh, through to its conclusion, you'd, you'd find that everything is in a plane of imminence and nothing is beyond it. So, you know, it, it's sort of operating within that and the doxy addresses plan or whoever is according this uh, tolerance or the actual officers of the law that are actually on the ground uh, the bureaucrats that are actually doing things, uh, interacting with the communities, are not outside of this framework of, uh, of uh, plane, plane of operation. Um, so I'm just wondering how, yeah. Uh, it's, Anas, can, we talk, can we just leave it there and see if Faisa has a, or anyone else yeah. has a response to that? Yeah, I just was going to add, um, just want to say that, yes, uh, it appears that the master plan or these planning regulations have this, like you mentioned, I use the term transcendental position, but I would argue that they're actually, that position is actually more imaginary. In other words, um, we tend to think that, um, you know, all, all that is informal is actually framed in a position, but in, in, you know, when you look at many of these studies closely, when you study informality today closely, you'll see that um, they're actually in concert with each other. So for me, it's not a hierarchy that I see between the plan 
and then the exception or the informal sort of like coming in later on is actually um, you know simultaneous in many ways. So um, I didn't talk about this, but uh, one of the chapters in my book deals with how the plan made certain informal spaces apparent, but they also made but it also made those spaces possible. Um, and I'm there. I'm using the example of these villages that were predate that predate the master plan itself. So if you think about you know which comes first or which comes you know, second. Um, you know, then, then, you know, it all sort of becomes more messy and, and you'll see that um, it's not the master plan that comes first, but it has this position um, of, you know, authority that in many ways is, is imaginary. So I'll just stop there, but I, I don't think that um, there's this hierarchy that I see, especially in my work um, between like the plan at the higher end um, and, you know, all the things that are out, out of the plan. They're, they're more in working together uh, one is creating the other, or um, yeah, or they're just they're, they're, it's, it's more it's more entwined um, is is where I would I would sort of um, stop my response. Thank you, Faisal. I'm going to read one of the questions out from uh, Inat Mendelson, who said who says it's three a.m. where she is and uh, doesn't want to wake anyone up. So to all, this is uh, Inat's question. To all, in your belief, how can open-ended planning be navigated? to mainly aid the underprivileged without turning it into a mechanism that benefits elite informalities. Like in the case of small apartments, this can be good for informal apartments, but it is a great back door for elites to take advantage to create cheaper homes for investment. That's for anyone. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just remark that, I mean, I, I think that that's an important question that, I mean, they, when, when we think about informality, the practices of informality really sit on this razor's edge, right? And I think all of us struggle with how to really position ourselves uh, as we say that there is something worth studying and worth respecting within informal practice while also not coming out as, as seeming well, and we're also, you know, anti-state, free market, just let the market do everything. And because many, many examples of informality can slip very much into that. So the apartment thing is exactly a, a perfect example, right? Where you have um, people flouting the laws to, to rent out apartments to, uh, in a more elite manner, Airbnb being another example of this, where it started against the laws and then becomes formalized. I think for me, I guess on some level, I want to sort of follow, it's, all, it's the elites who get to break the rules and then ask forgiveness later. In fact, that's a mantra of Silicon Valley, right? Break the rules and ask forgiveness later. That's what Uber did, that's what Airbnb did, that's what all of these sorts of elite models have done. And I, and I guess part of my argument uh, is that, um, you know, what if we applied that same ethic to, to the, or as, as Faiza said, ordinary informality, the informality of the urban poor, um, which often doesn't get that benefit of the doubt. So I think making clear that, that there are two kinds of informality and one gets treated differently than the other, uh, and then also making it clear that we, the informality of need is important because it's not just about renting a place by the beach in, in Sydney, but uh, for a week, it's about putting a roof over your head and feeding a family. Uh, that that deserves much more attention than than say you know making rules easier for Airbnb, um, but it's a it's a razor's edge certainly. We are very close to time, but uh, John Neve has been very patient. John, yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, how important is it to uh, have? To have a legal system that um, that works for uh, the people and not vested interests. I feel I like I'm talking too much, so I'm going to let someone else take that. <laughs> I think we might take that as a comment. I think the answer to that is uh, uh, there's going to be a fairly wide agreement about that. I think there was an earlier uh, question too, which is about, and this one can go to Ari, uh, what is the current situation in Chile? 
Yeah, I think maybe uh, Patricia has um, better speak about this since he's actually there. But um, from, for, from my understanding, um, you know, through interactions with Patricia and through what's what, following the situation, is that um, the protests have subsided a little bit due to the, the lockdowns because of COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also a, a vote on a new constitution on the 25th of October this month. So there's been an uptick in terms of protests from both um, the, 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 the original um, protest movement, but also people from the right wing um, parties that are seeking to like to vote no to the constitution. So, so for those that don't, don't know, there was um, one of the, the main demands around um, the, coming out of the protests was for the, um, the constitution written in the Pinochet era to be changed. Um, so that was um, in 1980. Um, and so they forced a vote on the constitution um, and that's going to be happening happening now. So it's a kind of exciting time to be thinking about what's going on. But Patricia might want to add something um, there also. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think, I'm sorry. I'm afraid we're going to have to call this to a, a close. We're out of time. My apologies to those who are still uh, in, a, in a queue waiting to um, ha have some more chat. Um, our next session in this, I want to thank, first of all, thank our, our speakers uh, very much for uh, such provocative um, short talks uh, that have uh, produced such an interesting discussion. Our next session in this series will be uh, next Wednesday, Melbourne time, um, on October 21st with Professor Alan, Alison Brown, who will join us from Cardiff University to give a, another keynote address entitled The Informal Economy in Urban Crisis Recovery. Uh, Red and Reccio will chair that session. Um, and there will be a, a further session on the 28th focused on informality in public space. Uh, the following week. So you can register through our website at infer.org, where you can also find recordings of any sessions you might have missed or may wish to refer others to. In the meantime, I want to thank our speakers again, Faiza, Ryan and Ari very much for sharing their ideas and to all of the audience for coming along and for your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you, everybody. Bye.